Good morning. Welcome to the next uh, session. We have Paul here today who's uh, been hacking the Linux kernel for, uh, for 14 years and uh, is currently working uh, for IBM. Uh, and they tell us here that uh, he uh, wrote the support for IBM's power processors in the Perf counter subsystem. So uh, I'm sure we've got the right man here to uh, give us a talk about it. So uh, let's make him welcome. Thank you. Is some luck? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, this is what I was uh, going to go through. Um, I've probably got too much material for the time, uh, but I'll, I'll try and move through fairly quickly. If anyone's got any questions uh, throughout the talk, just put your hand up. Uh, if you can wait for a microphone to come round, that'll be good. Otherwise, uh, we'll handle it. Okay, so I thought I'd actually start with a demonstration um, just to show you really how easy this stuff is to use. Um, so if I come here and I, I... Okay, so here we have a little program I wrote just as a demonstration of how to do this stuff. So what we're doing is we have a little program. We want to know how many TLB misses we're getting. So you can see there down down here I have a I have a, a, a loop that does some mathematical computation and uh, I'm doing some a couple of iterations over a two-dimensional matrix and if we look at the top it's actually a moderately big matrix uh, 100 million elements so what I have first of all is that I set up this uh, perf event attribute structure I initialize a few fields I do a I, I, I do a, um, uh, a sysperf event open call. That's fairly straightforward. I get a file descriptor. Um, I do my thing, then I do a read from the file descriptor and I print a number. So what does this all give me? Well, when I run the program, uh, so uh, first of all I compile it. And then I run the program, and it tells me that I took 200 million TLB misses. So that's interesting, but it does seem to be rather slow. So what can I do to find out why it's going slowly? Well, I can perhaps look at the program and realise what a silly mistake I've made. Or if I just want to get some more data first, I can type perf stat minus C... Uh, 1D miss. And get a count for the number of level 1 data cache load misses that I've incurred in running the program. So you can see there that I've actually had the program monitoring itself and also monitored it from the outside. Then I can think, gee, that looks rather high. It shouldn't be that many. And who can tell me what I've done wrong? Yeah, I know you can. <laughs> Answer over there? Yeah, I'm a Fortran programmer. <laughs> I have programmed in Fortran. Yes, David Howells. I probably want to reorder my loops. Very good. So I can do that. Uh, and I can reorder them like that. It's probably a good start. Uh, recompile my program. Don't know why this takes so long. <laughs> There's probably a performance problem in there, yes. And I can do that. And I've significantly reduced the number of, uh, of misses, and I've also reduced the number of TLB misses, of both cache misses and TLB misses by doing that. Um, so that's just a quick demo of how easy it is to use all this stuff. Right, so let's go back here. Right, so what is it? It's a new kernel subsystem that gives you access to the performance counters that your CPU almost certainly has in its hardware. That's where it started. 
It also provides an interface that lets you get to kernel trace points and software events that are generated inside the kernel. And it's becoming the primary interface in the kernel for collecting and reporting all sorts of data about what's going on in your system and how that can affect performance. So not just events that the kernel, so, sorry, that the hardware knows about and can count, but also event that the kernel knows about and can count. So that's the new kernel subsystem part of it. There's also, coming along with that, a new user space driver program for all this new kernel stuff, which is called Perf, and I'll talk about that. And what Perf gives you is a simple way that from just the command line, you can measure aspects of your program's behavior and, and performance. And uh, it not only does the sort of counting that I showed you before where you count the total number of something, but it also lets you do profiling and, and many other things as well. Uh, profiling would be where you ask, where specifically in my program are these events occurring? And it supersedes uh, PerfMon2, OProfile, and PerfCounter, which have been the, you know, up till before, you know, up till 2008. These, they, they were the, uh, the only ways that you had to get to this sort of stuff. So how did this all come about? It's actually, um, uh, in a sense, blown up fairly quickly. Um, there was a, it, it happened that in December 2008, uh, Stephen Rothwell started including the Perfmon 3 tree uh, into the Linux Next releases, and that got the attention of Ingo Molnar, who then uh, uh, reviewed it fairly carefully and responded quite negatively to it. So, <laughs> yes, I'm being polite. Uh, so his response then was that he and Thomas Gleichsner uh, posted a proposal to the Linux kernel mailing list in December 2008. Um, that initiated quite a lot of discussion, as you can imagine. Um, eventually, uh, it developed. I mean, I was initially sceptical of it, but came around to see that it was actually a good way to go uh, and, and got in involved and started helping with the development. That development was done mainly in the tip tree that Ingo and uh, Peter Envin and... Um, who's the other guy? Thomas, yeah, of course. Uh, maintain, and it was then pulled into the uh, into Linus's tree in the 2631 merge window, and uh, obviously then came out in 2631 September 2009. Now initially, um, Thomas and Ingo's code just supported x86 processors. I jumped on, onto the bandwagon and then added support for all the 64-bit power server processors from, basically from power four on. I haven't done power three yet, but no one seems to be really asking for that. Uh, so, you know, power four, the 970, that's the G5 processor, power five, power six, power seven are all supported. Um, since then, SH and Spark 64 have also added support for their hardware. And in fact, most architectures have got basic support because you don't really need to do terribly much. You can still have a useful system uh, even without supporting specific performance counter hardware in your system. As long as you've got basically high resolution timers, you can get all the software events, you can get profiling based on just uh, elapsed time. Uh, you can get quite a lot of useful stuff just by implementing um, this subsystem. There's basically just a system call you've got to implement for your architecture. Uh, and then you get quite a lot of stuff without any specific hardware support. And of course, it's still being developed. There's still stuff happening. It's um, accelerating, if anything. And that discussion all happens on the Linux kernel mailing list. So I'll just run through the, a few basic concepts first. The basic thing about perf event uh, in comparison to, say, perfmon2 is that your basic thing that you're working with, your unit of what you're handling, is just a single counter. It's not the performance monitor unit of the CPU. Where PerfMon2, I think, actually went wrong was that it said that, okay, if you want to measure some performance events, we'll give you the whole PMU, and you can, you know, it's up to you to work out how to program it, what events you're going to count, uh, what values you have to poke into registers to get it to count those things, but you get the whole PMU. And then while you've got it, no one else can use it. And that really gets to be sort of a bit irksome. 
um, the reason why Perth Mon 2 went that way was the belief that it was too complex for the kernel to work out uh, how to program the PMU to count a set of events, um, which is understandable but I think wrong, and I think we've proven it wrong. So, with perf event, if you want to count one thing, you ask to count one thing. Uh, if you want to count three things, you ask for three counters. If you, you know, well, you ask for a counter for the first thing, and a counter for the second thing, and a counter for the third thing. Um, if someone else, if another process also wants to count something, they can ask for a counter, and your use doesn't block them out, and vice versa. The counters are logically 64 bits, um, regardless of what the hardware does. Uh, often the hardware only has 32 or 40 bit counters, but the, um, the kernel subsystem makes it look like it's 64 bit. And obviously, every time something happens, the counter increments. There are several different types of event that you can count. Hardware events, things that the CPU hardware knows about, cache misses, TLB misses, uh, floating point operations, there's all sorts of things. That's counted, those are counted in hardware. There are software events, and the way a software event works is that somebody has placed a procedure call at some point in the kernel code to say, this event has happened. For instance, in the page fault handler, the, the do page fault function um, of each architect, well, of the architectures that support this, there is now a call to, you know, per software event happened, and it's got some parameters that tell you things like the address of the page fault. That hooks into the perf event subsystem and enables you to count page faults for your process and to profile your process according to page faults and all, all those sorts of things. There are trace points, which I'll talk about a bit more later. <coughs> These are more generic things that have been placed into the kernel in moderately large numbers already, where at interesting points like, you know, a block I.O. submission, there'll be a, 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 a one line that says, OK, we're doing a block I.O. submission here. And the perf event subsystem can now hook into that and count those as well. Finally, and this is something that's still in process, hardware data breakpoint registers. That's a register in the CPU that says, when a program writes to this address, take a trap. They can be used as events as well. Okay, so, so far we've been talking about counting, which is how often did this thing happen or how, how many times did this thing happen? You can also do sampling, which means that when you've got to, say, you know, 20 page faults, you can say, OK, tell me some information about what happened at this 20th page fault. You can record, for instance, the instruction pointer of the user process. You can, say, record the time, you know, time in nanoseconds um, since some point in the past. You can record some addresses. The page fault handler gives you an address. You can record that. And you can, you can say, I want to take a sample every 20 counts. Or you can say, I want to take about 100 samples per second. And then what the system will do is it will observe how often the events are occurring, and it will adjust that interval dynamically to try and get you to about 100 events per second. OK, now these events, we can count them, and we can consider them to be per task events or per CPU events or per task per CPU events now. That's, that last category has actually just recently been added. A per task event is saying that you're only interested in the events that occur while a particular task is running. Look, for instance, my, my demo program. I was using per task events there because I just wanted to count the TLB misses or cache misses caused by the activity of that task, not the ones caused by <coughs> other kernel activity or other... Um, task activity. On the other hand, sometimes you don't want to worry about individual tasks, but you want to say, what is my system doing as a whole? So then you can use per CPU counters, and what they do is that they basically sit on one CPU and count everything that happens on that CPU, regardless of which task is running. And so you can do system-wide monitoring by creating a per CPU counter on every task, uh, every CPU. I should say. Now, one interesting thing about per task counters or events is that you can say, I'm not just interested in this task. This might be you know, a make process. I'm not terribly interested in what the make does, 
But I would like to know what the make and all the CCs and LDs and everything that the make forks off and runs. I might be interested in that whole tree of processes. So what I can say is I want this event to be inherited. That is, I put it on the task and then if the task forks, the system will automatically create a matching one on the child. And then if that child forks, its children will get events. And then all of these, from all of these sort of children counters, get summed up back into the count that is reported. Finally, I can say I'm only interested in user mode, I'm only interested in kernel mode, I'm only interested in things that happen in the hypervisor, if you have a system with a hypervisor. So as I was saying, the kernel manages the PMU. It's not like Perfmon 2 where basically it just hands it over to you and says, go nuts. Here we have the kernel managing the performance monitor unit, sharing it between different users of the PMU, scheduling hardware events onto and off the PMU. So for instance, for a per task counter, in the context switch code, when we switch a task in, we have to take all the counters that are associated, all the hardware counters that are associated with that task and put them on the PMU. And then when that task stops running, we take those counters off and we put on the counters for the next task. Now, because we're doing this and because we can have multiple programs all using the PMU at once, there is the possibility that we may have too many hardware events for the PMU. When that happens, the kernel takes the responsibility of round robin scheduling them. Uh, so what it will do is it will put on as many as it can and then every so often for a per task counter, uh, for, for a task it will have a list of counters and for every so often it will rotate that list so that over time all the counters will get to run on the PMU even though any given counter won't be running all the time that that task is running. Now, this actually leads to a problem. And the problem is, is the, the solution that we have to the problem is this concept of event groups. The problem is that I might be trying to measure, uh, say, level one cache hits, and my hardware, it can count level one cache references, and it can count level one cache misses, but it can't actually count level one cache hits. So what I do is I create two counters. I create a counter for level one cache misses, and a, and a counter for level one cache hits. Sorry, references and misses. I can create a counter for references and a counter for misses. And I run my program. But then I find that the, 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 the count of misses is greater than the count of references. How did that happen? Anyone, can, can anyone tell me how, the, how I got more, more counts for misses than for references? Yes, Willie? That's right. The, the counters were on at different times and the program changed its behaviour between the times when uh, the miss counter was on and the times when the references counter was on. So what we can do is we can create a group and what I should have done is I should have created an event group that had both these two counters in the same group. And then the kernel says, OK, I realise, I recognise that you want to do some mathematical computation on these two numbers, so I'll make sure that they're both scheduled on and off at the same time so that even though the counts that I get don't reflect the entire execution of the program, they do represent the same subset of the execution of the program, so the numbers can be meaningfully compared. And you know, similarly, you can take ratios and that sort of thing. Finally, you can have a pinned group, which is one where you say, I really, really, really want this to be on the PMU whenever my task is running, or in the case of a per CPU counter, I really, really want it to be on all the time and then the kernel will do its best to make sure it's always on the PMU. If it can't achieve that, then it will actually tell you about that via an error, error return. Okay. So moving on, this is the, pretty much the entire API of the perf event subsystem. So first of all, you ask for a counter using perf event open. The attribute structure tells you exactly what you want to count, tells the kernel what, exactly what you want to count. Process ID and CPU 
specify if it's per task counter which task you want to count, if it's per CPU counter which CPU you want to count. The group parameter is used for um, making event groups and flags is currently unused. The interesting thing is this returns a file descriptor. That means that you can do all sorts of standard file operations on it. You can do a read and that will tell you what the current value of the counter is. You can do an MMAP and that will give you access to the ring buffer where samples get stored. You can do a poll or a select and in the case of a sampling counter that will let you block until there are samples to look at. And finally there are some IO cuddles to do things like enabling, disabling counters, resetting, syncing. There's also a PR cuddle call. This is sort of a little bit odd, but basically what it does is it says, OK, I'm going to enable every counter you've created or I'm going to disable every counter you've created. It's sort of so you can create a bunch of counters initially in the disabled state and then you know, with one operation you can start them all and, and start monitoring with all the counters that you've created. There are some syscuttle variables, things that appear in Proxix kernel, uh, basically security settings and limits and things. Um, normally, a per CPU, normally you have to be root to create a per CPU counter. Um, that sort of policy can be controlled. Finally, uh, at least on power, you can actually, if, if you've got counters that are monitoring your own process, you've created a counter that's monitoring your process, you can actually read that counter in user space without taking a system call. That actually turns out to be a lot faster than doing the system call, doing the read system call. Now, obviously you can only do that if you're monitoring yourself. If you're monitoring another process, then obviously the counter is not counting when you're running because it's on that other process. So you can't use it if you're not self-monitoring. And I'm not sure of the situation on x86 whether x86 can actually uh, do this or not. I'm not sure. Uh, the question was how do you do that? Do you mmap the counters into user space? On power there are user mode instructions for reading the performance monitor unit registers directly. And yes you do do an mmap but what you get in the mmap is you get the information that first of all tells you which PM you counter this event that you've created is on, and secondly, what's the offset between the value in the hardware register and the software counter value, if you follow me, the, the virtual counter value. Um, so using those two things, you can, it's then fairly easy to just read that register, add the offset, and there's your, there's your number. But, The question was, is the inheritance of the file descriptors coupled with the inheritance of forking? So when you create an event, you get one file descriptor. When that gets inherited to a child, there isn't a separate file descriptor that you get. Um, so the file descriptor actually then has a whole tree of counters hanging off it, in a sense. Um, whenever a process in that tree dies, its, its value gets added in back into the main value that you would read with the read system call. Um, so if you wait till everything's finished and then read the counter, you get the total sum. There's also a sync operation that basically runs around and pulls all the counters up into the main counter that you can read. No other questions? Okay, I'd better move on, I think. Okay, so I'll just move quickly through this. Um, this is the perf event at a structure that specifies what, what you want to count. It's got the the type of event uh, plus the config uh, element that tells you uh, what specific thing you want to count, sample period, what to record, what to return on read, um, the rest of those things. I've just got a little picture here of the ring buffer that samples get stored in. It's just a fairly ordinary ring buffer. You have a header area that's one page and then a data area that's some power of two number of pages. Uh, the kernel fills this in and moves the, uh, moves the head pointer. You can see there that um, I should use this thing, shouldn't I? You can see there that okay, the tail pointer is pointing at sample one, so that's the next one that user space would read. The idea here is that the kernel is filling this is the producer, user space is the consumer that's reading events out. 
Um, so, yeah, the kernel has generated three events and the user space is reading them. That's fairly straightforward. Um, the kernel does detect if the head wraps around and meets the tail, and in that case it will store a, a little record saying you lost some data here. And then once user space moves the tail pointer on, the kernel can store some more. Things that we can put into the sample. The sample's a variable length. They have a little header that tells you, I think tells you the length and stuff. You can store the instruction address, task ID, timestamp address. Uh, that address is a different one from the instruction address. Um, the times when we get an address stored there. Firstly, um, if it's a page fault event, then you get the address at which the page fault happened. Secondly, at least on the power CPUs, they have a, the ability to sample an instruction pointer and a uh, data address uh, when an event occurs. And those are put into some special registers that then get read and, and stored here. So if you've got the PMU, if you're recording an event that generates um, addresses, um, like you're profiling load instructions or something, um, then if you use the right events in the PMU, it will actually save these addresses for you and you can uh, you, for instance, you, you, can, you can say, tell me about load addresses that miss in the level one data cache. And then in your samples that you get, you will actually see the addresses that have caused these cache misses. Um, another interesting one is the call chain. And the cute thing here is that it doesn't just trace the call chain back through the kernel. It also goes into user mode and traces your user mode program where its call chain is, so that you can see that your user mode program is spending a lot of time in, in this function, but not just that it's in this function, but it was called from that function, from that function, from that function. And you can see, for instance, that 30% you know, of the time it's been called from up here, and 70% of the time it's been called from over there. So you might want to look at why this one is calling your function so much. Another interesting thing is that in this ring buffer, we don't just get the samples that um, reflect the events being counted. We can also get other things, like we can get a, a record put in there every time the process does uh, an mmap. In other words, creates a mapping of a file. <coughs> and so the, what that lets us do is it lets us map uh, the addresses that we get back to an executable or a shared library. And the system also generates synthetic MMAP events when you start up, so that basically when you start monitoring, you get to know about all the mappings, well, at least all the executable mappings that the thing has, and then as things get mapped and unmapped, as the process does an exec or exits or forks or various other interesting things, it actually records that so that you can track what's mapped where in the address space. One of the things we've tried to do is we've tried to provide a level of abstraction that's a bit above the raw event encoding that you use in the, for the PMU, for hardware events. So there's a set of what we call you know, generic hardware events that pretty much every CPU counts, although not necessarily all in exactly the same way. But on pretty much every CPU, you can count how many cycles have been consumed you can count how many instructions have been completed. And there's a way to say, I want to count instructions completed without having to know that the event for instructions completed on my particular CPU is, you know, event hexadecimal C12E5 that you have to program into a register to, to get that. You can just say instructions completed and the kernel knows that that's C12E5 on the particular CPU you're running on. So that's kind of cute. So the events in that set, CPU cycles, instructions completed, cache references and misses, branches executed, branches mispredicted. So they're, they're the sorts of things that are useful for just a high level view of where your program is doing the things that are likely to be expensive on modern CPUs. As I said, they're not necessarily directly comparable between different CPUs, um, particularly between architectures, because Sometimes the things that are, count that are actually counted are just slightly different. But anyway, it gives you 
a good first level view. Then there were a set of things that that didn't capture that um, we wanted to try and make more easily available. So Ingo came up with this idea that we could, we could present things as basically a sort of a cross product, a cube, uh, if you like. So on one axis you've got which cache in the system you're talking about. A level one data cache, a level one instruction cache. LLC is a last level cache, that's like a level two cache or a level three cache if you've got that. Instruction TLB, data TLB, branch processing unit. On another axis, you've got the operation you're doing. Are you reading from the cache, writing to the cache, or prefetching into the cache? And on the third axis, you've got what happened. Did, w was it just the access, or was it an access that did a miss? So uh, fairly simply, you can, you can get quite a lot of useful events out of that. Finally, there's, a, there's, in most cases, an awful lot of other things that the CPU can actually count. And so what you can do then is you can just specify the raw event code for your, which is obviously very CPU specific, but you know, if, if there are libraries that can map that in user space. Um, so then you can find the raw event code and say, count that. For a hardware data breakpoint, um, obviously the things that you specify is basically the address and then there's a length that says how many bytes you want to monitor. Okay, the software and trace point events. Software events, the first one, this, this elapsed time in nanoseconds, it's, it's kind of interesting because obviously we don't have something that we increment one by one every nanosecond. <laughs> that would be a little bit time consuming. So this one is sort of faked up. But using the elapsed time counter, you can profile on that and that gives you the time-based profiling that um, is often quite useful. You can count page faults, context switches, CPU migrations, and now, on power at least, you can count alignment traps. That's where an instruction uh, takes a trap because it accesses a misaligned operand, uh, which on power is actually not, there's very few of them. Most of them are handled in hardware, but some of them are handled in software. And instruction emulation traps. Finally, trace points. As I said, there's quite a lot of trace points being put into the kernel. Now, the trace points sort of up till now have been going through the F-trace tracing infrastructure, which was the function tracer. The way this has developed has been a little bit strange because we had the function tracer and then all sorts of other tracers started using that infrastructure and sort of became sub-tracers or modules in the, the F-trace uh, subsystem. And now what's happening is that most of those are being steered over to the perf event subsystem instead. Um, the function tracing, I think, is a bit more difficult to integrate into the perf event subsystem, but certainly things like the block AO tracer and things like that that just use the, the, the TP event, the, the trace event uh, macro, now get steered into the perf event subsystem so that you can do all of the counting and profiling and so forth. Uh, that all comes for free. Any questions? Question here? Are you going to? No, I'm just wondering if the microphone's coming. On Intel, I can ask the CPU directly for its timestamp counter. Sure. Um, I use this in profiling. If yes. I'm also going to use lib events and get the time that a particular event occurs, how can I match these up? How can you match the timestamp counter with the time in nanoseconds? Um, I actually don't know. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Sorry. <laughs> well, it's, it's more than it's Intel specific, and I'm not really an Intel expert. Yeah. Do you know Willie? Yeah, that's um, my understanding, and I'm not an expert on this, is that the TSC may actually change rate depending on your, your power state. So um, it, it might not be possible. I, 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 think, I think there are other counters available that we could use to match those two up. So. OK, then all, you, all you're going to need is the offset and scale factor. So we just need to give, get, get a way to give you that information. 
Okay. There's another question down the back. Are there any plans I'm aware of to get this onto System Z? Uh, no, there aren't that I know of. Um, yes, I mean, I actually suggested to Martin Schwedeski that he might want to look at it, but apparently there was some problem with that. Um, so, it's a question here. For Postgres, we embed dtrace probes into the code so that we can access counters on a per database operation basis. Sorry, which probes? Uh, uh, for the PostgreSQL database system. We embed dtrace probes right. on Solaris yeah. into our code so that we can access counters on a per internal database operation. It seems like we should be able to do it with the performance counters, but I'm not all that clear just from your presentation on how that would work. Um, uh, are there any examples? Is anybody embedding it yet at this point? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, as I said, it's only been in a released kernel since September. Um, my laptop that's got Debian SID has it in the kernel, but um, I don't think, like, Ubuntu 9.10 doesn't have it. So it's still fairly new. Um, certainly what you can do is you can create a counter in the disabled state, then you know, if you want to measure the activity of a piece of your program, you can enable the counter and then read it. Enable it before, run your code and read it. And I expect that things like JITs will tend to do that. Um, I'm not clear how DTrace probes connects into that. I don't know very much about DTrace. Stuart? So I did some benchmarking on like uh, RDTSC and the like, and it's ridiculously expensive uh, if you're never actually touching it. And then I tried binary patching uh, at runtime, which is fun, because uh, NOPs are free on x86, uh, essentially. But um, with this stuff, I actually do a bit uh, different things, where it's more like uh, try and track uh, where your CPU time is going to watch which SQL query uh, kind of thing. And some of the tracing stuff I haven't tried really yet, getting it going to find out what was executed to execute the SQL query, because you mostly get some of that and explain that's a bit nicer, but I find it sort of a bit of a different thing to detrace, which is more of a scripting language on top of some probing points with right. uh, modifying, adding some knobs and patching at runtime kind of ickiness. Plus, it's only Solaris, so it doesn't work on my laptop. <laughs> okay. It's a bit different. Sorry, was there a question in there or was that a comment? Uh, more of a, I think uh, what Josh was trying to get at was how to do uh, uh, more... Uh, uh, tracing of what, uh, what's being executed rather than just uh, reading the, the PMU, which I guess is more F trace than perf events. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, or some of the profiling stuff that perf does. Anyway, I'd better move on. Uh, this perf program that I demonstrated quickly before, it's a simple way to do quite a few different performance analysis tasks, uh, certainly not something that's going to do every possible performance analysis task. It has quite a few subcommands. It's modelled on the git command, so you say perf and then some verb and then parameters. Okay. Um, it does both system-wide and per process tree monitoring. It's in the kernel tree, which is a sort of interesting place, but seems to be working. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem that you can say app get and install perf command or something. Apparently, Fedora has it. Well done. Um, to build it, you need libelf, uh, you need a libelf and probably a libdwarf. You can, either, you can either build it 32-bit or 64-bit and it will work either way. Obviously, a 64-bit version, you need a 64-bit kernel. Um, but if you're building it 64-bit, then you need the 64-bit versions of these libraries, obviously. Has these list of commands, um, which I've been told I'm just about out of time. Uh, so I'll just skip through. Perf help is useful, perf list is interesting, perf stat is the one that just does an overall count of a process, um, although you can do system wide counting. You can use perf list and that will tell you what events you can count, although it obviously doesn't tell you all the raw hardware events, you have to, you have to find them out somewhere else. 
perf record, if you want to do profiling, the thing you do is you do perf record and run your program. So you can see the command there. That's your program that you run. That generates a file, perf.data, so it doesn't output anything beyond what your program outputs. Uh, you can specify what event to profile on, count, frequency, and so forth. And then you run perf report. And perf report reads that file and summarizes it in various different ways. You can sort on you know, process ID, the command, what shared object, symbol, and so forth uh, it comes from. And that then gives you the profile that you can look at. You can also do perf annotate, which is very similar, except that it will disassemble functions and show you at the instruction level, uh, and optionally with source lines as well, where you're getting all the hits. Perf diff is an interesting one. It, it takes two profiles that you've recorded with perf record and shows you the difference. So you can use that if you're trying to optimize something to see where you've made, where you've made some improvement. Perf top. What this does is it's actually a dynamic profile of the kernel as you're running, and it shows you which functions in the kernel have been using the most time in the, in, you know, just recently. It's often useful, interesting to have a perf top running in a window while you do something else. Finally, where is all this stuff going? As I said, uh, there's a move in progress moving a lot of other event reporting, counting, uh, statistics type infrastructure over to use the perf event stuff. So a lot of, as I said, a lot of the ftrace traces are in the process of moving into the perf event subsystem. Uh, there are people working on integrating it with k-probes so that an event can be that you've hit a certain place in the kernel. Dynamically specified, you put a k-probe there that then generates the event that gets counted. Uh, we're working on using perf event to managing the hard hardware data breakpoint registers. And the way it looks like that will work is that, in fact, perf event will manage the hardware data breakpoint registers, and then other users of that will go through the perf event infrastructure in the kernel. So for instance, uh, ptrace and so forth. We want to do some better event scheduling, uh, support more architectures, advanced hardware features, um, and extend the perf program. So a quick legal statement, and we're done. Thank you. We do have time for one or two questions. If anybody uh, has one, just uh, put your hand up and I'll bring the mic over. Uh, can this be used by processes that aren't running as root, or do you have to run your processes as root to use it? Non-root users can do uh, can monitor their own processes. Basically, it's the same check as whether you could F, whether you could p trace the process. So uh, you can do all sorts of per task monitoring uh, as a non-privileged ordinary user. Um, the default is that per CPU monitoring you have to be root, and the reason for that is that there are security worries if you could start to monitor what's happening on a CPU, and then there's some encryption program. You know, somebody else's encryption program running on that CPU, you might be able to get some information about what it's doing, you know, what the key is or whatever, from from monitoring its behaviour, you know, in ter particularly in terms of certain you know, CPU operations, multipliers or whatever, or uh, cache misses. There's the potential for leaking information there, so that's the concern. That about wraps it up for time. Um, LCA 2010 organisers and uh, the sponsors Fiasco Wine would like to thank you for uh, your time and expertise today, giving you this lovely bottle of uh, Sav Blank. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, it's now lunchtime. The next sessions will commence at 1.30pm. Thank you.